Hi, my name is Rob. Uh, I am the director of a program on human security and technology at the Harvard Humanitarian Institute. Uh, HHI is kind of the humanitarian arm of Harvard University. Yes, it does have one. Um, and so for my program on security and technology, so what does that mean? Uh, so by way of uh, kind of a background on our program. We got a start in uh, 2011 uh, using uh, remote sensing, using satellite imagery uh, to detect on the northern border between the then formed uh, uh, Sudan and South Sudan uh, pockets of, of violence and, and potential atrocity to corroborate some of the stories on the ground in these areas of interest. Here is one such slide uh, from that report where we were looking at uh, in a matter of June where there was nothing here and uh, in a month later kind of identifying uh, where there could potentially be mass graves. Uh, and so this was the kind of work we were doing to make sure that uh, kind of the question that we could have. I mean, back in 2011, this is something for which the military had certainly been using for some time, but the, the advent of uh, an application of satellite imagery for humanitarian purposes, especially for the identification of uh, uh, potential conflict and the use in non-permissive environments was still something very much emerging. So it really was a research question on our end, even though this report was going out to, to folks on the ground, as to say, what is the role that this can play? And we continue to do this now in a conflict forensics way, uh, where we're using this, where we're using social media and other open source channels to create uh, evidentiary bodies uh, for criminal proceedings. So that work continues. And that's the, the, one of the main channels of the work that we do. But one of the other biggest ones that we do uh, is standards and ethics. And this really came out of the question of what we observed in using satellite imagery and remote sensing and GIS um, and where we were pulling uh, uh, data extractions from HOT to identify amen uh, you know, from amenities for building types and using that to identify more areas of interest is this literal top-down approach of using technology here. And we adopted this work on standards and ethics because we found uh, one in our own work there where uh, we were able to generate a lot of reports and a lot of useful information. Uh, there were also instances in one such instance where we identified what we thought were a line of troops uh, moving uh, from one uh, admin province to the next and where we, we thought we were watching uh, the assemblance of military personnel and literally minutes before that remote went out, one of the retired generals that we had uh, reviewing our work before publication said, actually, uh, those are cows. So that's a true story. H Harvard loves when I tell that story. They love that. But it, it's moments like that and it's mo so many other moments that we had in which we realized that you know, if, if the technology and the work that we do as a telescope, we're, we're looking at the wrong end. The promise of technology allows us to do more operational things and then afterwards we think about the ethics and afterwards we think about the right side of things. As if the technology is enabling the ethics, enabling the rights. We were able to do so much of this. The technology didn't introduce it. It maybe made it more efficient. It maybe made it more scalable. But it never allowed us to do the rest of this work. So we really wanted to work on uh, publications and bringing out, I think, out of this research, the way in which we flip that lens around and we think through rights and standards and ethics, not as the backstop to the work that we do and as we rush ahead with technology, but to think as rights and ethics uh, as tools and technologies themselves. Ursula Franklin said that everything is a technology. Rights are a technology, ethics are a technology, standards are certainly, and thinking about minimum technical standards that we bring to so much of this work, well, that's certainly a technology too. So in starting from here and then working towards a technology, how we were able to see and do so much more with the affected communities and populations. Or to put it better, uh, acts are therefore the ultimate outcome of ethics when we think about that ethics as a technology. Um, We published in 2017 Signal Code. Uh, this was the distillation of a lot of the principles documents that we have for rights-based approaches, but also including in that international human rights and humanitarian law as the backdrop for a lot of these uh, uh, recommendations. And then later on uh, in 2017, we then published the obligations um, available on signalcode.org. There's my pitch. Um, 
on this, where we, we really kind of distilled all this humanitarian law and all the, and within that too, the guidance that we have from even things like the Belmont Code, uh, the Nuremberg Code, the things in which we, we talk about um, humanitarian, uh, or sorry, we talk about uh, human experimentation. I'll come back to that in a second. But it, it's these main things where the agency for data, privacy, information, protection, redress are, are the main things that came to the surface for us as to what needs to be at the forefront when we consider the, the ethical use of technology for humanitarian interventions. Now, take a breath and pause right there because this is the part where usually in the data ethicist side, we have to kind of go down that, that weird parental thing where it's like, we're not mad, we're just disappointed because you're not doing enough. But the fact is, I'm, I'm thrilled right now that I can actually talk about HOT, that we are doing a fantastic job really are. I mean, there's the hot code. If you go to missing maps in their about page, uh, right after, like, you know, it's like, here's our objectives. And then it's like a list of ethics is the second thing on there. Um, and I think everyone, I, most people in this room, maybe everyone in this room uh, who's been doing this for a while has this photo. This is one of mine. You might see some familiar faces with Kate Chapman and Jeff Heck and Amir Hartato. This was a, a photo that I took uh, in the earliest days of the hot in, uh, Indonesia project out there. This is back from like 2000. 11, maybe late 2010. Um, and I look, what's with the missing context of this uh, is not that while we were going out there and doing trainings on HOT, this is one of those moments in which we, were, we flew to the island. And this is us listening to the surveyors out there of how are you doing it? What, what is the current practice and model that you have right now? Um, what kind of questions are you asking in the community when you go out and do the common surveys here? Uh, and to listen to that first and then to bring that into the, the technical training so we didn't lose their process. Uh, in all of this. And I think this really speaks to the fact that HUT is very community centric. We're listening to these communities. We're incorporating uh, that feedback. And that is such a huge, huge part of it. Such a weird slide. At the same time, I think, I mean, I would challenge and posit that this is kind of our Civil War moment as well uh, for Marvel Civil War. And if that doesn't land with everyone, it's also not a sports metaphor. So you're welcome a little bit. Um, <laughs> But this is that part, if you haven't seen the movie, uh, a, a small group uh, of individuals imbued with uh, uh, wonderful and magical uh, technical capabilities, sound familiar, uh, have to make a decision for which are we actually uh, working towards um, the, the do no harm principles? Uh, do we have to take that a step further into regulation and practice? Do we have to self-regulate? Do we have to come up with a more stringent list in which uh, we have rules and regulations of how we do this work. And if we do not follow that, there may be consequence. And that is kind of the decision now in terms of taking this forward and thinking of those principles and of that community-based and the community-driven work that we do, what more can we and should we be doing uh, to then think through how do we lead with that in a very regulated and a very systemic uh, and systematic way? If you take also uh, uh, nothing away from this, uh, if your organization doesn't have a rights-based approach, Don Cheadle will come to your office and just make this face until you do. Uh, chilling. It's just chilling. So again, uh, when we think through, and I, so I return to this, and I return to the fact that if you, if you can think through rights as a technology itself, it, it really does help to kind of distill down and think through, well, this is, this is the first thing to adopt in terms of a minimum technical standard, which is among the things that we're working on now, um, and think through who else, like HDX, uh, you know, with the Hexa language, uh, what else is out there that we can be pulling from and adopting in that. It's the matter of just taking one technology uh, before the next. And it's going to become so much more important over time. Uh, again, Ursula Franklin, the question to ask are whose benefits, whose risk, rather than what benefit and what risk. The point in that quote being who, who over then what. Because the fact is, uh, what we've seen today, what we will see more of today, uh, is this new um, adoption of AI which I don't mean to kind of poop on right now. I'm super excited. I'm thrilled by the advent of this new technology in which we can become so much more efficient in detection uh, and observation that we're going to take years off of what we would have to do manually here. 
I'm thrilled by the uh, thing of uh, going out and doing mapping parties and mapathons in which we're not having people just kind of trace buildings. Very important stuff, don't get me wrong. But that may mean that if we can automate that, we're putting them more towards the data validation. We're putting them more towards how can we build in more of the metadata behind this to make it more attractive, uh, more consistent, and more attractive to, to companies and organizations for them to use. At the same time, what we've seen a lot of this is I think of you know, research that we've looked at at the University of Austin, in which one researcher was able to take the uh, Netflix profiles, anonymized Netflix profiles from about somewhere between 500 to 1,000 people, and reverse engineered it to find the individuals uh, that were also on a list with some personal, uh, personal information here, and we're able to say who was who. Within this as well, uh, there was an article from the New York Times late last year, uh, in case you didn't see it, in which they were able to find uh, selections of the uh, data from mobile operators uh, that ha was being sold uh, to third parties without the knowledge uh, of their clients and customers there. And from this, uh, it was always kind of understood that, well, I mean, you know, it's pinging the towers and it's pinging the satellites from time to time, but not so much that, you know, it really couldn't be uh, identifiable. Uh, actually, it was a lot more than that. And they were able to actually find, I remember this in one case uh, for New York City, they were able to find uh, the mayor and his kind of entourage as they looked at his public schedule uh, for the day, and they looked at where it was being pinged around town, and they saw one individual surrounded by about six other individuals at all times. Uh, and they were able to do the, the correlation between that and, and find out, well, okay, we know exactly where he was there. It's this kind of attention towards AI and automation, though, uh, that we find, you know, the troublesome part of, of losing the who uh, among the what uh, in that. And we also think about where, uh, you know, Google has failed at certain parts as well as one company, uh, just to point at that, as I think the example that comes to mind, that we can find many more examples, uh, in which when it comes to automation, when it comes to AI, the voices that they use are male, you know? Uh, the, the data and the perspectives are largely uh, patriarchal as well. So when we do this, we, we lose, I think, the capacity and, and we start to also, uh, without that ethical kind of framework, without that inclusivity and rights-based frameworks, we fail to ask the questions and we lose the who within this as to say, well, who are we also representing? The big who, the small who? So. I'll skip that in the sense of time. This is a slide from my award-winning TED talk uh, entitled, How to Lose Your Audience Immediately. So, but I feel like I'm running a cooking show here in which we're like, let's talk about the cool thing we're gonna make, uh, but then not actually uh, cook anything. So by way of, I think, just kind of uh, looking at, you know, what is the research, what highlights of the research to date, I just wanted to share a few things. Again, this is uh, the Signal Code and Obligations, the publication that we put together, again, for that uh, human rights law, uh, humanitarian law, and the principles, approaches towards those recommendations and obligations. People are taking photos, so I'll post. Okay, cool, got it? Um, this is a plug for good friends and colleagues, uh, Sean, Martin, uh, Sean Martin McDonald and Keith Pocaro, who are talking about civic trusts. Um, one thing also, I think, uh, when we think about these approaches here, is that what we're really talking about as well is the application of what is called duty of care and putting that ahead of uh, the rule of law. And so these, the, the rule of law, the rules that we have in place, the legal obligations that we have in place, uh, in, in some cases are formed with duty of care at the back end of this, the, the rules that say, well, what are the moral and legal obligations that we have to people as well? Um, that would be like the technology and the rights. But this, I think, is one such legal framework uh, if you're, uh, and I'm not a lawyer either, so, but I, even as a, like a non-lawyer, this is super interesting. So uh, what it is though is that it's basically network governance. Definitely check this out, in which we actually put the ownership of either the data or the software in a civic trust so that the community, the network around it, has the ownership and the rights to the data before the host company. I may not be doing the best job describing that. Check this out. These are all the links from the site and the writing that they've done. Uh, definitely something worth looking at. Additionally, uh, one such thing in which I'd love to have an ongoing conversation about is, who here knows what um, awesome uh, PII is? What's time? Tyler, I saw your hand first. 
Awesome. The next question, I usually don't get a response to this. I may in this room. DII? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. See, I knew I could trust this room to do it. I almost never get that last one here, but it is coming into play. And this is the part, I think, in which we can do, uh, we, hot as it's leading in so many other places, can lead in the application and the understanding of the importance of DII and how that does actually come into uh, data protection and privacy. And these are a few things in which uh, the team and I have written about on that front is to the definition of DII. Uh, and by way of, I think, context around this, uh, I remember one such project that I had with USAID where we were working on the open data policies and I was later uh, then pulled into the office of the AFPAC team, and the, sorry, the Afghanistan Pakistan team. And their response was, you will never have our data. Uh, point being is that even though we were anonymizing it before this was put online and shared online to remove names, to remove any kind of other phone numbers, anything like that, it doesn't take much in a rural environment to think, well, someone in this village got, you know, eight sheep, eight camels, let's go out there and it doesn't take a whole lot to find out who within that community was the recipient in those cases. That's one such example of kind of DII and the ramifications and consequences out of that. So it's stuff we've written on here uh, that I think Hot could very much lead on. And a couple of things that come to mind just in terms of, and Rebecca talked about this earlier, uh, the importance of making sure that uh, gender justice, uh, inclusivity, disability, age, sex are all also brought into this conversation at the forefront uh, of these things as well. So, um, for me, I have also uh, proudly just joined uh, the board as a member at large, and I think this is one such thing where I want to help champion these conversations. So rather than the Harvard email, I'll share the hot OSM email. Please, and I'm R.R. Baker on all the things, um, but probably don't hit me on Twitter because Twitter is accessible. So send me an email. I would love to continue this conversation and think through how we can do more on the data protection side, how we can do more on the ethics side, and to, I think, bring more, and I do say more because I do want to applaud and appreciate all the effort that has been done to date, but bring more of that uh, to the surface of our work. Thank you. Water I think Rob, uh, this is a very, very good presentation. Thank you. Thanks for all That's kind. the principles. Uh, I'd like to know your thoughts or any reflections you've had about indigenous data sovereignty and... Sorry? About indigenous data sovereignty and what it could oh, mean so. for our work. No, that as is... Hot, as the hot family because it's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, by way, I think of, I mean, let me start also with kind of my experience on the sovereignty side is I don't know that I think writ large as uh, just a field itself, starting there, that I think we do enough in terms of those considerations. I've certainly run into projects in the past for which people may understand um, what capacity they have, whether it's technical capacity of like servers or technical capacity of staff to help with cleaning data and managing data uh, versus though thinking through that for example, I mean, like if you found, uh, well, we are out of time, my goodness, they're kicking us out. Um, if you found a historical artifact, it should go to the country's museum. We are mining the data of this company and then putting kind of it out to the world in this way. And I'd like to do more, I think, to respect, I think, kind of national sovereignties on this and community sovereignties. One other thing I failed to mention on, great, on the AI side is, and this came up in Mikkel's talk earlier, of just the automation uh, on this and barreling ahead on that removes, I think, even the conversation with these communities as to uh, rights to be forgotten when we think about kind of uh, the correlation to EU law. It also thinks through what their goals are, what they want to achieve, what they feel like, you know, what, what is our stake in this? Uh, wh how do we want to define ourselves and our community and that level of sovereignty at that community level as well uh, as to think through? And I think this could be the backstop that could stop us from, I think, just apply, 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 and then come back. You know, move forward with the data, move forward with the technology, we'll automate, we'll come into these communities and show them what we can and have in some cases done, and then ask the question. We have to ask first. And that, I think, is, I mean, the top level. So does that somewhat start to, that's a big question. Does it somewhat get into it? Yes. 
They read a blog uh, from another OSM volunteer. That, I'm sorry. So read a blog in, 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 from the OSM family that, okay, let's map indigenous lands. And that, that sounds good. Yeah. Representation justice. On the other hand, uh, does that community want to be mapped? Mm. And if they want to be mapped, which features have to be hidden and remain sacred? Yeah. Uh, and this is what I learned from our Maori intellectuals, mm. Pacific intellectuals, activists, indigenous scholars. Yeah. And okay, if there has to be mapping, are we the ones who are supposed to make the map? Mm. It's, just, it's a big question. It is a big I don't question. I have an answer, but, the, but I always thanks. hear this from our indigenous colleagues. I think this is I why we, we need the, the think conversation. About that very properly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Others? So I guess we could stay in here because I think there's no other session behind that. So if there are more urgent questions, I was just thinking maybe the people who want to transition to another session could just go. And we, we could have a couple of more questions if you don't have to, of course. But you want to. I'll wait for everyone to run away first. And <laughs> um, my question is just about the use of the word ethics. And I, like in the last year or two, I've been thinking a lot about how in the open data and open source community, we use this word ethics a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you look, like, delve into the word, use the word's meaning, it's talking about a moral framework where you find things in terms of right and wrong. Um, and given that we are such a rainbow nation of people involved in, in open source and open data, um, those concepts are very different in different communities. And um, so I'm like in a one-man campaign to stop people using the word ethics and to try to talk about value frameworks or value systems rather hmm. because um, what's ethical for one person may not be ethical for another person but if we can agree on shared value frameworks in uh, data and open source I think it's a much more constructive argument I'm tired of people telling me I'm not ethical because I use Google or you know which is you know I, you know, I don't care because it's not in my um, my uh, value framework whether uh, you know it's, uh, I'm using proprietary cloud vendor or not you know and um, I just want to raise more just a comment that you. Um, yeah. uh, we, ethics can be a kind of a judgmental term where, where like the idea of values is more um, like a, a common uh, like set of views that, that we should try to sort of think away. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, I'm not going to take that away. My, my response would be just the, the experience of it was funny to work on signal code and to take so much international law and distill it down to like five words and people were like, you just lost like all of the context. It's, it's too general. But the point I think is shared in terms of you have to start from a place that is generalizable so that you can bring in national context, community context, the, the, the context I think of the communities to fill in those gaps themselves with what they consider. Otherwise, I mean, you could be anything from being a colonialist, I think, in an approach to very simply just kind of, uh, again, stepping on what is already established within those communities. And so, yeah, we, we did generalize it on purpose. And I think we, we bring that to it. I think there's a shared sense there. I also love this. The values framework, I think, is absolutely valid. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, the, the, thanks for the presentation. Thank thanks. You. Yeah. A, a good step away from some of the other discussions. Um, the, the process that you presented, the, re, the re, reverse process where we put the rights and the ethics first, how do you, I mean, is that, does it have to be that way mm. or is it that it could actually be iterative and it's just something that we're missing by generalizing a little bit? Yeah. Because technology, the way technology develops and to be user-centered, it needs to be developed iteratively. Yep. We need to continuously obtain feedback. Yep. Isn't that the same for ethics? Like, don't they change? You know, can't we improve them over time or our mm -hmm. ability to address them over time? Yeah, no, that's an amazing point. Thank you. Um, 
Yes, iterative, and I think also concurrent. One of the, I think, one of the other kind of uh, questions slash criticisms that we often hear is in terms of, I mean, we're doing humanitarian work. When you think about, in some cases, the technology comes first simply because the need is present and immediate and urgent. And it's like, we, we don't have time to kind of set up a governance system here when people need water and food and shelter and medicine. Um, and so that is one thing that, that immediately kind of comes to the surface. So I agree in terms of, and it's, it's one of the things in which we try to frame it as a, a, like kind of the technology amidst the other technology is that submit bug reports. You know, one of the things uh, prior to working at Harvard was uh, we worked on the, f uh, I was at the White House and we worked on the federal open data policy and we actually put the policy in GitHub and people were submitting pull requests and, and kind of submitting bugs for the policy itself. It's one of the most fun things I ever worked on um, as kind of a techie myself. And uh, it was great to think about it in that way, that the policy could be open to that level of kind of interpretation uh, outside of kind of the old stodgy commonplace way of, well, we need a committee for this and a subcommittee and the subcommittee for the subcommittee and that has to go into policy review. But just to be able to at least have the conversation, even if it wasn't immediately adopted, that the comments were there and transparent and, and surfaced in that way. And it was part of this cycle. And I think in this way, the rights become part of the cycle as well as we continue to have these conversations. So yes, iterative, yes for concurrent, yes for iterative in some way where we're not being prescriptive and pushing out the other side and allowing, I think, people to be innovative uh, in those ways, but that you know the rights are there for the ride and not just kind of the on the MEL side of like the monitoring and the evaluation and learning side of, well, let's do everything and then check. And then check just that once and we'll submit a report for the next project. So, yeah.